Welcome to the new world of animal allies, the doctors, volunteers, pet owners and other surprising visitors who are out there making a difference. In Animal Doctors, a tiny kitten undergoes life-saving surgery. In Russia, two orphan bear cubs are rescued by animal helpers. Reluctant to vaccinate a pet, Animal Allies How To shows it can be easy. And Animal World takes a breathtaking look at the mystical seahorse. Meet Mopsy, a three-month-old kitten with a nasty-looking infection. Mopsy is the victim of cat flu, which she caught because she hasn't been vaccinated. Not only could she lose her eye, she could die. Yeah, you know, I think it's fairly certain that that's what's happened, mm. and that the cat flu virus has settled into that eye and, and really badly damaged it. To be honest, this eye looks beyond anything that can be sorted out. But animal ally Dr Jessica Gower is hopefully not only going to save her life, but save her sight as well. She doesn't so seem, apart from her nose and the nasal discharge and this dreadful eye, she seems completely her normal self. She's not gone off what's, otherwise. Yeah, what's going to happen about the eye? We'll have a look at that in a minute. I think, to be honest, you're going to lose this eye. It, it, it's not something that's just suddenly happened. It's been coming on to look at it for a little while, and it's a very, very badly damaged mm. eye. Do you want your mum and dad to come in for us to have a talk about it? Yeah, I think I'm better. Shall I get them? Yeah, do you want to do that? OK, I'm going to give her a shot of antibiotics, and um, a bit of antibiotic ointment in both eyes. Um, it's too late to help the ruptured eyeball, but I just... At three months old, Mopsy lives with her owner, Laura Mawson, in a terraced house in south-east London. To anyone else, she may appear just another cat, but to Laura, she's very special. But it takes more than just being an animal lover when owning and caring for a pet. ...the check-up, because, I mean, you've been good owners, but you hadn't spotted the eyes. After about 15 minutes, Dr. Jessica is concerned that Mopsy's condition is very serious. She needs to operate and prepares the consent forms. Laura signs them, but she's still upset that she didn't notice Mopsy's condition earlier. Uh, devastated. Didn't realise that we should have brought her in earlier. Um, lucky that she's going to be able to save the other one. Dr. Jessica is also worried that Mopsy might have the cat equivalent of the HIV virus, known as FIV. If Mopsy's test is positive, she may have to be put down. So, after Laura says her farewell, Dr. Jessica takes Mopsy to the isolation ward. She fears the kitten could still be contagious, and the last thing she wants is the cat flu to spread. The night shift vets at the Blue Cross Animal Hospital treat all kinds of emergencies. Benji is just one of 26,000 animals seen every year, and they're not all fans of the doctors. Michael is worried that his terrier has a reoccurrence of a spinal injury. But before examining his leg properly, Dr. Jessica wants to see the dog in action. Benji is clearly limping. Pointy metal that must have been floating around a pavement or something. All right, that's it. Muzzle okay. off and home. Right. If you pause at the desk on the way out, the okay. nurses will ask you for a donation yeah. and they'll give you some heavy scrubber to bathe it. You don't want to throw it away. Yeah. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good night. Dr. Thank Jessica's you. next task is to go and check on Mopsy, who is in isolation. This is a germ free zone where the hospital keeps animals with infectious diseases, and Mopsy's cat flu is highly contagious. 
Mopsy is settled and oblivious to the operation that will take place in less than 12 hours. The next day, Dr. Jessica's team make Mopsy's operation their top priority. They carefully prepare for the complicated eye removal. Such a big operation is always a risk because Mopsy could react badly to the anaesthetic. Other complications could also arise. Um, we've anaesthetised Mopsy using all the same agents we would use really if it were a human baby. Do you know, I think I would clean, I think I would clean that just with saline. Um, the kitten's in a, is in a bad way and it's a shame because it's just really unnecessary. She just needs to have had a vaccinated mother and to have been vaccinated. Um, and I mean, cat flu is a traditional killer of cats, particularly kittens. Well, The Blue Cross Hospital is a charity which provides an essential service for people who have nowhere else to take their pets. It's open 24 hours a day. There's no charge for treatment here. The hospital merely asks for a donation and the huge team of medical staff and state-of-the-art equipment makes them one of London's greatest animal allies. But this nurse's immediate concern is preparing for the operation. Motsi is now ready to go into the theatre. In Animal Doctors Part 2, Mopsy's operation continues. The end of another traditional Russian bear hunt. Until a few minutes ago, this female bear was hibernating. Now she's the latest trophy in a sport which has reduced Russia's bear population to the verge of extinction. These hunters were paid a thousand pounds to take a Russian businessman on a hunting expedition. But the female wasn't the only victim. Buried deep in the snow are her young. Left alone in the wild, orphaned bear cubs will almost certainly die from the cold or be eaten by predators. Many are given to circuses or kept as village pets until they become too big or too boisterous to keep and are eventually put down. For these bear cubs, the future's much brighter. They're about to start the long journey to the Babanitsi Bear Orphanage, 250 miles outside Moscow. Here begins the long process of rearing the cubs and returning them to the wild. It's important the cubs develop a healthy suspicion of people from the start, so human contact is kept to a minimum. No one knows this better than the man behind the project, animal helper Professor Valentin Pazitnov. He says there's a system in which on the whole you have man, food and bear. It's a system with a reverse link. If there's food, there's man. Through food, man persuades the bear to do his work. But in raising the cubs, we try to do all we can. And I think we've been successful here to prevent such a link being formed. When the bears reach four months, they're allowed their first taste of life in the forest. By this point, the bears' memories and senses are fully developed, and they're free to roam around on their own in order to learn the ground rules of survival. Dr. Masha Vorontsova is from the International Fund for Animal Welfare. During 10 years of the project's its existence, 64 bear cubs were released into the nature reserves. And uh, we know that only one was killed by hunters. Uh, all of the rest are living fine, and we know uh, that they were traced by rangers in the nature reserve, and they know exactly the place where they're going to hibernate in the winter. They know that they leave in summer, they see the traces everywhere, and that is the direct evidence that the project works. 
At six to eight months, the bears are whisked out of their enclosures, tranquilized and tagged, before starting the long ride to the nature reserve where hunting is banned and brown bears are almost extinct. The big moment arrives and the latest batch of orphaned bears are finally going back to the wild. As long as hunting is allowed during the hibernation season, Professor Valentin Pazitnov says bear cubs will continue to be orphaned. These bears are among the lucky few to survive. As for the newly orphaned cubs, their journey has only just begun. Cats are not especially known for their obedience, and Peter's six cats are no exception. Animal Allies shows how simple it can be to vaccinate a cat. Dr. Justine Braun is making a house call to give these cats their first vaccination. This is the only proven method of protecting them against the common infectious diseases. The first thing to do is to try and convince the cats to cooperate. They're very nervous, sensing immediately that something's going on. Dr. Justine examines them thoroughly before administering the injection, making sure they're in good health. This simple vaccination can save a cat's life and prevent a range of diseases. They're now protected from cat flu, enteritis and leukemia. Some of these diseases are fatal, especially cat flu, which is notoriously contagious. You can tell your friends it wasn't so bad. But even though they've only managed to lure four of the cats out today, Dr. Braun will be back. Um, we'll be back in two weeks in any event to vaccinate, to get right. a new booster, because they're starting a new course of vaccinations. So right. we always boost yes. the first time. Right. And then we'll be doing a vaccination every year thereafter. Right. Great. Now, um, generally there, there are very few side effects involved with vaccinating. You may notice that they will be a little bit drowsy this evening, the ones that we've done, and that's quite normal. They might not want to eat tonight. Mm. That's really just a stimulation of the immune system rather than an actual reaction right. to the vaccination. So for this week's yeah. Animal Allies yeah. How To, contact the local vet or animal society and find out when the cat or kitten needs to begin a vaccination course. Follow up on booster shots. Keep an eye on the cat after the vaccination for any reaction and contact the vet immediately if unsure. The seahorse, possibly one of the most beautiful and magical creatures to grace the world's oceans. Everything about this unique fish is remarkable. Perhaps this is why it has such mystical qualities. Not only is the seahorse's appearance out of the ordinary, its biological capabilities also distinguish it from the rest of the animal kingdom. Dr. Heather Hall and Luke Rosser are two of the world's leading authorities on this fascinating creature, and both are heavily involved in a European breeding program. Seahorses are incredible fish. I mean, they're extraordinary. Most people don't even think they are fish. So they're, they're fascinating in the first place. They're such unique creatures. They have so many um, characteristics you don't find in any other animal. So it's very unique. The fact that it swims upright means, at first glance, people really don't know what to make of it. Seahorses have a, an amazing prehensile tail, and you can see it being used all the time in these tanks. Its main function is to hold on to a piece of seagrass or coral or um, anything that's around really and keep them secure, wait for food to come past and then ambush the food. It's, and these are completely carnivorous, they're feeding on live shrimps, very small fish and that kind of thing in the wild. They have a very unusual life history and biology. 
and they're extraordinary in their behaviour to watch. So just about everything about seahorses is unusual, different and very interesting. It is the way that seahorses reproduce that really sets them apart from the rest of the animal kingdom. The male has a pouch called a marsupium into which the female lays her eggs. It is the male who then fertilizes the eggs and cares for them for about three weeks. At the end of the pregnancy the male gives birth to between 100 and 250 babies. But unfortunately, it is the unique nature of this creature that has undoubtedly contributed to its demise. Until 1994, we didn't know that seahorses were in trouble. But my co-director of Project Seahorse, Dr. Amanda Vincent, discovered that absolutely enormous trade in seahorses. They have now become a conservation issue. 52 countries have been identified as actively trading in seahorses. A major consumer is the Chinese traditional medicine market, which prescribes seahorse for a number of ailments, including asthma, skin complaints, broken bones and heart disease. If this level of consumption continues, it will not be long before seahorses disappear from our oceans altogether. As a response to the dwindling numbers and to prevent what would be a major tragedy from happening, Project Seahorse was born. Project Seahorse is a team that works all over the world with people who export seahorses, people who catch seahorses and people who use seahorses, either for medicine or for the aquarium trade. And at each step in that chain, we try and improve the sustainability of the fishery to make sure that seahorses are going to be around for many, many years to come. The best way to reduce the pressure on wild seahorse populations is to stop people fishing. But because there's such a dependency on the fishery, we, and because these communities are so poor, we can't just go in and stop the fishery. You have to provide an alternative source of income. Project Seahorse has also encouraged eco-tourism, such as seahorse watching. It's also in the early stages of building aquacultures in Vietnam, which include seahorse farming. The eventual aim being to breed them in captivity rather than take them from the wild. Seahorses are, are just a magical fish. Obviously working at the aquarium at, in London Zoo you are surrounded by hundreds of fascinating fish species but I think seahorses are, are particularly special. Um, they're very unusual to, to watch, they're very um, rewarding to work with but also because it's part of a bigger broader program of conservation you feel that you're actually making a difference you're contributing to marine conservation in some way and that's the fundamental motivation for working with the animals if it wasn't for the work of project seahorse all around the world it wouldn't be long before this beautiful creature would be nothing but a memory Back at the Blue Cross Hospital, Dr. Jessica Gower begins the grueling operation to save Mopsy the kitten. The inside of Mopsy's eye has to be left intact, and the blood vessel has to heal properly and remain infection-free. Before Mopsy's eye is removed, there's some complicated stitching to do around the kitten's eyeball. I think an important thing about animals is that they feel pain in exactly the same way that humans feel pain and that's why you know, use of painkillers and just kindness to animals is as vital as kindness to people or children but the good thing about being an animal is that you don't have the same fears or worries that a human would have so this kitten will be entirely unconcerned that it only has one eye. It's finally the moment when Mopsy's infected eyeball is ready to be removed. Dr. Jessica sews Mopsy's right eyelids together. Mopsy is now ready to go back into isolation where she will slowly wake up. Should be fine. 
fine, he had a good anaesthetic, potentially painful, but he's on best Clever kitten. Well done. Mopsy looks as though she's recovered well. She's doing fine. She's come around very, very quickly. She's bright, she's purring. Um, and whereas yesterday her purring was very anxious, I actually she she sounds to me like she's Welfare-wise, she looks quite she looks quite reasonable for a kitten that's had an op this morning. She's relaxed. She's actually pawing with her feet. I think partly it's because of the opiate painkiller she's on. I think she's actually relaxed and purring. Aren't you? Mopsy's FIV tests have come back negative, and now Dr. Jessica's last task is to let her owners hear the good news. Hello, I'm sorry you're not in. It's Jess Gower from the Blue Cross ringing about Mopsy. I'm just ringing to let you know that Mopsy is doing fine. She was very good under her anaesthetic. She had an uneventful enucleation of her eye. She recovered her In the next programme, the new world of animal allies continues when the rare Thai tiger makes a special appearance. And animal ally and writer Carla Lane opens up her extraordinary animal sanctuary. There are ways to make a difference.